Hi, this is David Dickens, and today we are talking about sequence of returns. We've talked about doing this over the last couple podcasts, so we're going to get to it today. It's often referred to as the largest risk you haven't considered. I think it's a really important topic. Hopefully it's a really good podcast and you enjoy every minute of it. I'm going to go get Walter and we'll get started. Do you need help protecting your finances as you enter retirement? David Dickens of KC Financial Advisors has got you covered. Welcome to the Cover Your Assets KC podcast. Hey, it's another edition of Cover Your Assets KC. Walter Storholt here alongside David Dickens. And you know what? We're not going to talk about grandkids today. We're not going to talk about upcoming camping trips and how the summer's going or golf. None of that. David said today we are getting down to business on the show and diving right into this uh, (laughs) great conversation about the largest risk you haven't considered. That's kind of dramatic, David, to be honest with you. Well, it's meant to be, but it's also, honestly, the largest risk you haven't considered. Yeah, it's it's, it's true. (laughs) It's true statement. (laughs) What I'm going to try to do, I learned my lesson a couple podcasts ago, and with all the numbers I threw at our very patient listeners. So I'm going to try to not drag you through a bunch of numbers, but make sure that the concept is really understandable and important to you, such that you might click on the attachment that Walter's going to put on this podcast. And then you can decide, where am I in this scenario, and should I care? Mm, I like that. Excellent. Yes, that PDF is going to be attached to today's episode, so just check the description, the show notes section, wherever you're listening and consuming. There will be a link there. Go to it. You can download this PDF. You can do that now and follow along with us if you'd like as you listen to the show, or just go check it out for further implementation after we're done discussing things today. So, yes, as I understand it, David, we're talking about uh, not necess- we're talking about returns. We're not exactly talking about rate of return is where you're going to take us today. Exactly. So if you ask most people what's more important, the rate of return that you earn or the order that you earn those returns, the vast majority of people would say, well, obviously, it's the rate of return that I earn. And what this podcast is going to demonstrate to you is, honestly, the order that you earn those returns is arguably more important than the rate you earned. So I'm going to go through a, the first example is a 36 year old professional who's 30 years away from retirement. Then two thirds of the way through the podcast, we're going to talk about a, a retiree who is 65 and we're going to look at how they did over the 20 years of their retirement. So, so the setup for this is I have a well-educated 36 year old that walks into my office and says, Hey, I want to retire. I want to know what it would take to retire with a million bucks at age 66, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that done. Now, you may be listening and said, well, I need a lot more than a million dollars. Fine. This, these are round numbers. You, If you need four million to retire, then multiply all this times four. But the, that's the setup. So we discuss and we say, well, you know what? You're young, so let's just put all of the account into an ETF that mirrors the S&P 500. This person is is not risk averse at all. They, they're happy with the risk, the fluctuation. They just want to make sure that they end up with a million bucks when they retire 30 years from now. So uh, we say, well, you know what? I think we could probably count on a 9% rate of return over that period of time. And so we, you know, we plug it into the calculator. Yep, that's what it looks like. So we fast forward 30 years and that same client is now not 36, but they're now 66. And this person was very diligent. What, what they were told 30 years ago was you need to invest 5,000 bucks a year into the S&P 500. And if you do that for 30 years, that's, and it earns 9%, that's going to be your million bucks. 30 years from now, they're sitting in the office and they've done that. They've invested the five grand a year. But what's actually happened on the rate of return is that they didn't earn 9%. They actually averaged 9.68% return. And that's the actual average return of the S&P 500, average annual return of the S&P 500 from 1980 to 2010. So that person and I are sitting there going, heck yes, we got this done. (laughs) But when we sit down, we start looking at the numbers and we go, oh, something must be wrong. And we do a recalculation and still something looks wrong. And so we start really digging into the numbers. And the chart that you will find on the attachment shows the actual rates of return 
for the S&P 500 and the deposits that this person put in over the years, 5,000 a year, and how they end up by the age 65. So what we find out is that with the first set of rates of return, same deposits, same investments, same average annual rate of return. If you look at it with one set of returns, you have, uh, instead of a million bucks, you have $562,800. This person's pretty disappointed and looking at me like, have you gone nuts? But if you take the exact same information, but instead of uh, the, the rates of return going the way they do annually in the first chart, if you flip them exactly on their head and say the 30th year of return is now the first year of return and reverse the entire program, instead of $562,000, you've got $1,031,968. Almost twice as oh my much. Gosh. So I'm that's looking kind of at astounding. these charts right now, and it's like it, this doesn't compute, David. <laughs> and I can do basic math, but the, come yeah. on. Exactly. And everybody thinks about this in basic math terms. They don't think about the sequence of returns. So here's the important takeaway on this, as, as hopefully at home, you're, you're looking at this chart. What's important is that the rates of return you earn in the early years the dollars amount that you have saved are pretty small. So if you get a big juicy return on five or 10 or 15 or $30,000, it doesn't matter nearly as much as if you take a big hit when you've been saving for 20 years and maybe you hit a couple years in a row when the market is down significantly. That's the sequence that makes it very hard to recover once you have your big amounts of money taking big losses in the market. Again, this is a person who we're just investing 100% in the stock market because they're young, they have a high risk tolerance, and they're only starting with five grand a year. So I think, Walter, you and I would agree, <laughs> with the same average annual rate of return, that's a dramatic difference, 562,000 at retirement versus a million thirty-one. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just fast forwarding my eyeballs sort of to <laughs> the uh, right around the, the late 50s on these two charts. Both numbers are in the 400,000s approximately. You get example number one of the um, the only half a million dollars approximately saved by the time this chart finishes out. They're hitting 400,000 for the first time in, in year 58. And the second chart hit it a little sooner uh, at 57, but actually is behind by the time they we end 58 um, or end 59 where the other one is. So they're both right on that precipice of half a million dollars. But then that's where, and then this is what's crazy, both of them only experience one more negative return year, but it's a big negative return year at age 63 for that first one. And that just really kills any of that momentum that had started to build Whereas the other is just, you know, even with a negative 10% year, just one year before 65, they still have a good year at 65. They have a couple of good years in their early 60s. And that's, boy, it's made all the difference, that timing at the end there. Exactly. So if, if your market history is pretty good, you could look at this person at uh, the top chart at age 55, 56, 57. Well, that was the dot-com bubble okay. that burst. Three okay. big years of negative in a row. Whereas on the bottom chart, that happened early on when they didn't have much money saved. And then that year when they're 63 years old, well, that was a financial crisis. Gotcha. So market history would tell you that every once in a while, not very often, but there are a couple of times in our history where we have had significant downturns, 40, 50% downturns that weren't recovered, that, that lasted at least two consecutive years. And they usually take well, with that Great Depression, it took longer. But for instance, 2000, the, the, the dot-com bubble and the financial crisis, those took five years just for the market to get back to even. And so sometimes these downturns, there was another big one in 73 and 74, 1973, 74. So it's not like they happen every eight or 10 years. But when they do, that's when you'd like to have some sort of 
risk aversion mechanism in your portfolio such that you don't blindly write it all the way down because it's really difficult to get back from a 30 or 40 or 50 percent downturn as we've said before a 50 percent downturn you have to have a hundred percent gain to replace what you lost in a 50 percent downturn so that's a person that's 36 and they've got 30 years to go what about a person that is 65 and just retiring and they're not putting money in they're taking money out they're going to live mm. off of the nice nest egg that they've put together and this person has the misfortune of retiring in the year 2000 so um, I, this is not an attachment this is actually a pretty good piece of work that was done by morningstar if you've heard of them uh, they did a really nice little study of sequence of return as well uh, schwab has a good re, a good one if you google sequence of return you'll get a bunch of hits and some of them uh, depending on your interest in this podcast, some of them might be really good follow-up reading for you. But this one, since a lot of our listeners are, you know, in what we call the retirement red zone, that kind of two or three years before or the two or three years after retirement, I think this is super important. So the next sequence of return example I'm going to give you is for somebody who's 65. And what happened by the time they were 85? They've got a million bucks. They are going to use the 4% rule, which means they're going to take 40,000, 4% of a million bucks out each year and give themselves a little 2% inflation increase each year. So 4% of a million bucks is $40,000 of, in, of income. And then they're going to add that to the Social Security and they're going to be happy. And they think that that is going to leave them in a good spot with their portfolio. If we use the actual returns, of the S&P 500 from 2000 to uh, 2019. That ought to be 20 years. What we find is that they start, each starts with a million bucks, but if we use one set of returns starting in the year 2000, this investor ends up with $567,000 on their 84th birthday. So they started with a million dollars. They've taken 40,000 uh, out each year plus a 2% inflation increase, but they kind of hoped that they were going to have more than 567000 on their 84th birthday. But if you just reverse, take the exact same annual returns, but reverse them, and you have... So, you know, if this person retired in 2000, everybody listening to this podcast knows that they lived in their early retirement years, they lived through the dot-com bubble bursting and the financial crisis. But what if we put those into their late 70s and early 80s instead of their mid 60s. Well, that million dollars would now after on their 84th birthday instead of being worth 567,000 would be worth 2 million. What? <laughs> A, so that's kind of astounding, wouldn't that you is, say Walter? That's even more astounding than the first example. Yeah. So the numbers are big at this point cuz they've retired. They got their million bucks and they're just going to take 40 grand out a year. Uh, but if you're taking 40 grand out a year when the market is doing really well, you can afford some serious hits later on. And you're probably not even going to get worried about it because at that point, <laughs> you've done most of the retirement spending you're going to do. You're worried about long-term care, maybe, but you're not doing your trips and, you know, taking grandkids on trips and et cetera, et cetera. So massive difference over 20 years of retirement, depending on the order of return. So, you know, the astute listener is going to say, well, that's all well and good, but I can't control what happens to the market. And I don't know when the bad years are going to arrive. So what steps might I take to mitigate or offset some of these risks? Sounds like a reasonable listener question. I would think so. So I can think of, of, of three things. There's probably 12, but I can think of three things. One would be, so this portfolio was 100% stock. If you're listening to this podcast and you're in your 30s, 40s, or 50s, and you look at your 401k, <laughs> it's probably 100% stock. I'm guessing that more than 80% of our listeners that are still working have a portfolio that is very heavy in stock. So 
There's a reason why advisors and fiduciaries and a lot of reasonable people have a bond allocation, a fixed income allocation. Maybe it's CDs, maybe it's bonds, maybe it's a fixed annuity, but you have something that provides you a fixed rate of interest when all of the noise, the good noise and the bad noise is going on in the stock market. So it used to be very common to have a 60% stock, 40% fixed income allocation, a basic 60-40 portfolio. Maybe you're less risk averse and you want a 70-30. Or maybe you're pretty aggressive and you want an 80-20 mix. Unless you have a really large nest egg, you are unlikely to have 100% stock in your portfolio. So one way to mitigate the risk of sequence of returns is to have a, a bond or a fixed income component to your portfolio. Averaging that out, or uh, depend, depending on the allocation, would be a decision you would make or you and your advisor would make. Another might be, I've got a couple of clients that do it this way, is that we set up a bucket approach. In other words, they're heavily invested in stock, but we have one or two years of spendable money in a, in a piece of the portfolio that can't go down in value. Um, it used to be short-term bonds because money markets didn't yield anything because in the, <laughs> in the last decade, a money market yield was about zero. But now it's four or five percent. So you can have uh, a really low risk portfolio of money markets and short-term bonds in a bucket that would be sized based on how much you think you're going to spend over the next two, three, four years. Remember the dot-com bubble, that took five years to get back to even as far as the market went. Uh, financial crisis took five years to get back to even. The next serious downturn, well, it could take three years or eight years. Japan just went through a 30-year period of trying to return back to even, which they just did. I'm not saying we're Japan, but there's evidence showing that it could take that long. A third approach, way less exciting for people, is that instead of taking that 4% out every year plus a 2% increase, you say, well, you look at your, your significant other and say, guess what? We're taking a retirement pay cut this year because our, our portfolio just got whacked and we were the unfortunate beneficiaries of the wrong sequence of return. So there are a lot of ways to, there's, there are a number of ways to guard against or insulate yourself from sequence of return risk. What I wanted to do in this podcast, and hopefully we've made it, you know, pretty clear and maybe encouraged you to <laughs> go hunt down some good information of your own, is that rate of return is really important but sequence of return, a risk you have probably never heard of or discounted. Sequence of return is a really important risk, and that's whether you're 35 or 65. So we got listeners, we got a lot of 30-somethings, and we got a bunch of retired listeners. So the reason I like this episode is it impacts everybody. So at least, at a minimum, become educated on sequence of return and then determine for yourself, what does that mean to me and to my spouse if I have one or to the other people that maybe are hoping to get some <laughs> money when you leave? Uh, your heirs might be a way lesser concern than running out of money. But this is an important topic. I'd encourage you to re-listen to this podcast once you've printed out the attachment. And then do some of your own research. If we can be of any help to you in understanding sequence of return and how it might be affect you, then we'd be happy to do that. But at a minimum, make sure that you have done a little bit of due diligence and that will put you ahead of the curve with the vast majority of your peers. What a great breakdown today, David. Really appreciate this. And again, we've got this PDF that really drives home that earlier scenario that we were talking about. And even though the withdrawal example is kind of the reverse of this, I think it just helps drive the point home. And it's just kind of a neat thing to look at the numbers and how they go so differently, how so similar they are at certain points 
and then where things just go awry. And it just I don't know, makes your brain work in a different way. So highly encourage you, if you listen to today's episode, just look at this on paper too, just to help drive it home a little bit more. That PDF is going to be linked in the show notes in the description of today's episode. So check that out there. David, I'm uh, that's pretty shocking numbers to see those, those differences. I, again, I know that we're somewhat unrealistic scenario of the 100% uh, quote-unquote risk here um, to show those dramatic variances, but it really still underscores the importance of, of managing these things and how a properly managed plan can make these kinds of huge differences. It's yeah. pretty interesting. And understanding makes you a, a more educated uh, <laughs> person who's accumulating assets or distributing those assets to yourself. So this is all about understanding the risk and trying to decide what does that mean to me yeah fantastic points if you have trouble absorbing all of this or understanding the ins and outs of it all and how it relates specifically to your financial plan well there's good news on that front you don't have to just rely on the generics that we cover here on the podcast you can have a one-on-one conversation with david and the team at uh, kc financial advisors you can go through the complete planning review process the cpr process have a conversation about your portfolio and your plan and what needs to change to make sure that you accomplish your goals as you head into and through retirement all you have to do to set up that time to visit or to ask any questions on your mind is to call david at 913-317-1414 or go to coveryourassetskc.com and there's great information on the website for you as well as ways to get in touch and schedule that time to visit. Uh, we'll link to that contact info in the description of today's show along with that PDF. Never hesitate to reach out if you got any questions on your mind. David, thanks for the great help today. Good episode and uh, we'll chat with you in a few weeks. I will look forward to that, Walter. Thank right. you. Sounds good. Uh, for David, I'm Walter. We'll see you next time on Cover Your Assets KC. Advisory services offered through Creative One Wealth, LLC, an investment advisor. KC Financial Advisors and Creative One Wealth, LLC, are not affiliated. We are an independent financial services firm helping individuals create retirement strategies using a variety of insurance products to custom suit their needs and objectives. The information and opinions contained in this program have been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. They are given for informational purposes only and are not a solicitation to buy or sell any of the products mentioned. The information is not intended to be used as the sole basis for financial decisions, nor should it be construed as advice designed to meet the particular needs of an individual situation. This material has been provided by a licensed insurance professional for informational and educational purposes only and is not endorsed or affiliated with the Social Security Administration or any government agency. It is not intended to provide and should not be relied upon for accounting, legal, tax, or investment advice.